Welcome to our first lecture in our course on compiler construction TDD for 205. So after our C crash course, we'll now start with the motivation. So why are we looking at compilers? Why are people actually working with creating, maintaining compilers? And a bit of the history of programming computers. So uh, the idea why computers uh, actually needed compilers to be used efficiently. So a bit about me, as you probably already heard, my name is Michael Engel. There's my email and my uh, web space here at NTNU. So I studied computer engineering and applied mathematics in Germany at the University of Siegen, got my PhD in computer science from Marburg University in 2005, and was on different positions in Germany and England, uh, also in industries, so at Oracle Labs, in Cambridge for several years before I came to NTNU at the start of 2020. And here I'm not only teaching, of course, but I'm also doing research and my research interests span broad areas of compilers, operating systems, parallelization, dependability of hardware and software systems, and embedded systems. So if you're interested in any of these topics, let me know if you want to write a thesis or something like this. Uh, we can discuss stuff like this. The textbook we are going to use throughout the semester is a relatively new compiler textbook by Keith Cooper and Linda Torsen. It's called Engineering Compiler Second Edition. This is not the traditional textbook you might know from different compiler courses, which is the so-called Dragon Book by Aho, Seti, and Ullman. Uh, the Dragon Book has a bit yeah, fallen out of time, so it doesn't discuss recent interesting developments in compilers like static single assignment forms and so on and it's very much on the theoretical and front end side whereas i think it's also important to take a closer look at back ends of compilers so how to optimize code for different uh, criteria such as performance or energy consumption in embedded systems so we'll take a look at both sides of a compiler and how they interact and this book is also a hands-on book which combines solid theoretical concepts with uh, yeah, interesting approaches to implementing them. And as you're going to implement your own little compiler throughout the semester in the uh, various steps of the projects you're going to work on, I think this is a good guideline for you to work on. Additional papers, articles, and so on can be found on my webpage. There's the course webpage there where you already might have seen the syllabus and there will also be exercises and so on for you to work on. So the overview for today is like this. So first we're uh, going to take a quick look at the history, the evolution of programming compilers. So starting from, yeah, just using wires to program compilers, so very much close to the hardware. To, uh, to compilers themselves. Uh, then we'll take a short look at the history of compilers, a uh, very shallow overview of the compilation process. Of course, we'll take a, a look at more details later on and a bit of a semester overview. So how did programming actually start? Now on this slide, you can see two pictures. So the first one is an engineer sitting in front of a large PCB and just plugging in wires. So this was the first way to actually program computers. So computers were actually fixed program machines. And if you wanted to change anything in your program, you had to switch wires. And these wires actually connected different parts of the computer. So uh, the state machine inside of the computer was efficiently reconfigured by replugging these systems. And on the right hand side in this photo, you can see one of the wiring plans. As you can see, it's a nice graphical notation, but I suspect uh, that not very many of you would want to program in that way using uh, such a wireboard and especially debugging this might be pretty horrible. So early computers were not as versatile as we accept computers to be. So there were more or less electric calculation machines, even though many of them were already so-called Turing complete and programming was really, yeah, handiwork, uh, plugging wires, soldering stuff, and replugging stuff when something didn't work. Obviously, this is not the way to develop modern fast applications and uh, something had to be done. So early programmable computers actually 
had a ways to change the program that was executed. So I'm giving you one example here. So the person on the uh, photo in the lower right hand corner is Konrad Zuse, a German engineer who developed the first computers in Germany during World War II. So the machine you see standing behind him is uh, a reproduction of his first computer that was working with electronic relays, the Z3 or Z3 system by Zuse, which was uh, destroyed in World War II. And this is a reconstruction of the machine that Zuse himself built with students of his, uh, which you can now see in the German Museum in Munich. There's another reconstruction of the uh, Z3 machine in the uh, Museum of Telecommunication in Berlin. So should you ever be in Berlin, you can take a look at that. And that reconstruction of the Z3 in Berlin was actually built by Konrad Zuse's son, who is now also long retired. So this Zuse Z3 machine actually use something called punch tape. So punch tape uh, is just yeah like a paste, uh, tape of paper. So a roll of paper which is relatively narrow and quite long. And in this roll of paper you are punching holes. So whenever you punch a hole you indicate you want a one, a binary one, and whenever there is no hole you have a binary zero. The problem for Zuse was that actually no punch tape, paper tape was available. But he was a clever engineer, so what he figured out is that uh, he could really cheaply get used cinema projectors and lots and lots of used cinema film. And cinema projectors have a big advantage because they advance the film at a given rate, like 24 frames per second. So it's very easy to have something synchronized to that clock to read bits in fixed distance. And what he did is he destroyed this film by punching holes in it to indicate bits. So each uh, column of that film you see here in the middle, which is uh, just a reproduction of how Zuse did it because I couldn't find an original photo. Each column here actually indicates something like a byte. And in this byte you have like eight positions. And if there's a punched hole in this position, it's a binary one. If there's no hole, it's a binary zero. And this was read using electric contacts. So you can imagine uh, that there's a column of eight electric contacts that's below the film and also above the film. And whenever there's a hole punched in the film, the electric contacts below and above the film, yeah, touch each, each other. So current is flowing. So you can indicate that there's a, a one. And if there's isolation in between, so there's still a bit of film in between because you didn't punch it out, you have no contact, you have a zero. So that's pretty interesting. And that's how Tsuzu built his first computers. Now obviously that's a problem because these tapes were not used to load a program into RAM like you used today you used to just load your programs from uh, a disk, an SSD or the network and then run them in RAM. Those were directly executed from this punch tape. This had some implications. For example, well, if conditions are really hard to build on that machine and backward jumps also, but Zuse already invented the first loops in programming. So the question is what's really on that tape? It's just holes or no holes? Here's a piece of paper tape and what you can see here on the photo is a manual punch. So usually you had some automatic machine like a typewriter that had a punch attached. So when you typed the key it punched the uh, corresponding bit pattern on uh, your paper tape. Uh, but you could do it by hand to correct stuff or to do really small stuff. So you simply had a pin and an array of holes and you would punch the holes by hand. So it's just bits on that tapes, one and zero. So it can be data, it can be text, it can be numbers. It can also be machine instructions. The computer doesn't really differentiate between all of these. So for the computer, it's all bit patterns and it just depends on what you're doing with it. So are you jumping to these? Uh, then it's actually yeah, code that's executed, instructions, or are you maybe reading and printing some of the contents of your paper tape? Then it's maybe an ASCII character that you're printing. So this was also still very primitive. And uh, as I said, these early computers had no program storage. So uh, this was very inconvenient. So later computers had main program storage. So they used paper tape only to load a program into memory. And of course, later on you had disks and stuff. Uh, 
So one example I give you here is a bootloader for a PDP-11 machine, which was a 1970s uh, era microcomputer by Digital Equipment. And this was actually the bootloader. So this machine had no ROM, like a BIOS ROM in a PC, you know today, but this machine really only knew how to load its first instructions into RAM from the paper tape, which you see on top there. And this contained enough code to boot the machine from something else like a disk drive. So it took quite a bit of time to boot your computer back in the 1970s, maybe a quarter of an hour or more. So the machine instructions are contained on the paper tape. And if you don't have main memory, the columns on that paper tape are read one after the other. So on the Z3, for example. So one thing you want to do is, of course, you want to repeat sequences of instructions. You want to build loops. And that's, I think, where the name loop actually comes from. So when you have a set of instructions encoded on your paper tape and you want to repeat them over and over again, you just tape the one end of the paper tape to the other. And then you have a real loop of paper tape which you just insert in your computer. And when your computer just uh, read the last instruction on your paper tape loop, well, it's skipped over to the first instruction again because you taped it again uh, to it. And then, well, it executed all these instructions over and over again. Now the problem that Zuse also had with his Z3 machine, and that's the reason why some people think it's not a really universal computer, is that the Z3 could not really execute conditional codes. So if then else, because it would have required to jump on the tape or something like that, that was simply not implemented. But there was a design for an extension that would have made that possible using maybe several tape readers. So in general, the Z3 can be considered a universal computer. So here again, I found a picture of a manually created paper tape loop in a very ancient 1950s or 60s style paper tape reader. And if our Zuse Z3 machine would read this, it would just read and execute this code over and over again until you burned the power off or the uh, paper tape would tear apart because it was used up. So of course, nowadays we have programs in memory because running code from paper tape and punching paper tapes is really, really inconvenient. So the guy who invented the stored program concept is uh, the guy you see in this photo here, John von Neumann, a Hungarian engineer uh, who later on worked in the US on the first American computers. And as I said, the computer doesn't really know if a bit pattern is an instruction or a character or a floating point number or something. So that was the really innovative concept by the uh, computers built by von Neumann. Uh, that code and data share the same memory. So you can mix code and data, you can load them to the same memory, and that made constructing computers cheaper and easier. So uh, until the 1970s, what you see on the uh, lower right hand side here, you could actually take a closer look at what's in memory using switches on the front panel of your machine. So uh, you had a set of LEDs where you could see the current address in memory and the current data at that address. And using these switches you see on the bottom, the, the light and red, uh, light and dark red colored ones, you could flip the address so you could look at a different address, but you could also change the contents of this memory address. So that was a direct interface to the memory of the computer. So if something went wrong, people started really debugging, having a list of memory addresses, flipping them in bit by bit, uh, and maybe even changing bits while a program was running to fix a long run operation without having to restart programs. And on machines like these without a boot ROM, the bootloader had to be toggled in by hand if you didn't have a paper tape ready uh, to do it. And this took quite a bit of time. But since uh, ROMs were really, really expensive back then, people actually uh, preferred to just having to spend a quarter of an hour to boot a computer back then. You wouldn't want to accept this nowadays, I suppose. So this is just an example of programs in memory. So a PDP-11 instruction word is always 16-bit or multiples of 16 bits long. So uh, you have punched holes and non-punched holes on your paper tape, which indicates ones and zeros. And these can be translated to octal or hexadecimal codes. So two of the, in this case, rows on this tape here would indicate one 16-bit machine instruction word and the next two ones would indicate the next machine instruction word and so on. Of course, 
that's nice and it's great to just try programming computer this way once and then well maybe think about doing it in some easier way i suppose so the first way to make programming easier was introduced relatively early so the problem is when you want to program computers you had to remember all these hexadecimal or octal codes for your machine instructions so you have to know 016701 means it's a move instruction and then you'd have to encode all the parameters like addresses and register numbers by hand and for just punching it into your uh, paper tape you would actually need to convert it to binary then that's very tedious and uh, well uh, essentially you just have a bunch of numbers so the first thing that people actually did is was to assign some yeah short form that is actually easier to remember to this sort of numbers so each instruction was given a name so on the right hand side here you see the equivalent so-called assembler instruction to these bit patterns the machine would understand directly so the right hand side is what is more human readable so it tells us that the bit pattern uh, in octal 0167010026 means a move from address 37776 to register r1 this is easier to understand this is easier to remember but it's still on a very very low level because the binary encoded machine instructions and the assembler level instructions which humans could use are on the same level of abstraction so you still have to use the primitive instructions that your processor can understand and cannot use more complex more convenient instructions here this was a first step but of course it was not enough to build the complex software systems we have today here again is just an example of going from binary to assembler or the other way around. Uh, if you're interested in IT security, you would probably see more of this because uh, reverse engineering, so if you only have a binary program that might contain a virus or a trojan, uh, you need to figure out what this is actually doing. And uh, for this, you need to generate assembler code or even try to regenerate the original source code to some extent so going from the binary representation which is the only thing you have when you have an executable program on disk to something you can try to understand to analyze a virus for example is really important so this assembler instruction that you're using so every assembler instruction actually consists of two major parts the left part uh, move in this example here is the so-called mnemonic so the mnemonic is just a shorthand usually like three or four characters which helps you uh, to remember what this instruction is doing. So move means move some value from one place in your computer to another. Inc means increment. TST stands for test. TSTB stands for test byte. BR stands for branch and so on. And most of these instructions have parameters like addresses. In this case for the move instruction, uh, the first parameter is a constant address with the value 37776 in octal. And the second parameter is a processor register, register one. So this makes it quite a bit easier. But still, as I said, that's not the way you want to work with today. Unless you're working in IT security, then you'll have to think about uh, yeah, working on that level sometimes. So the first thing people did was they tried to make a simpler source code better readable. So uh, on the left hand side, you see we have all these magic numbers like 37776 or 352 or something else. And this is really inconvenient because this means you still have to remember numbers as a human when you write programs. And the first thing that people actually did was to improve assemblers to enable so called uh, symbolic names for constants and memory addresses. So the symbolic names for memory addresses are also called labels. And if you look at the code on the right hand side, you see it has changed a bit. So uh, we have additional things in this code. The first thing we have is comments after the slash slash. So that helps you to remember what you actually did in that program uh, when you have to look at it half a year later. And we have uh, been able to replace some of these magic constants like 37776 by actually symbolic names which are easier for us to remember so that might be the register of a certain IO device which we want to uh, write a value to uh, there's also 
other addresses in that code that indicate a branch target. So if you want to do a conditional jump with the BPL or BR instructions. So here you can also now insert names of uh, addresses, so labels. So these labels are always left justified like loop or offset or weight and end in a colon usually. And so you can now say BPL weight to jump to the instruction that uh, stands after weight or BR loop to jump to the move instruction that's indicated after loop. So that's making programming a bit more convenient, but still you're programming on the level of the machine. So you need to know what the machine instructions actually do. And this is still tedious and of course it's not portable. So if you have a machine with different machine instructions, like nowadays you would have maybe an x86 PC, but you might uh, also want to run code on a Raspberry Pi, which has an ARM CPU, you would have to rewrite your program from scratch because these have completely incompatible processors, which means you need to uh, learn new assembler instructions and to use these new instructions to write your program. That's very inconvenient, obviously, still. So we need to do better. So people thought about using more abstract levels of description. Uh, that's what we call high level language. We've seen the assembler helps us humans to read machine level uh, language programs or even to write them, but they're still a bit missing compared to higher level languages. So the first thing that's missing is really constructs to enable program structure. In assembler, you only have conditional and unconditional branches to some addresses. What we really want is to have loops like for, while, or do loops and conditions like if and switch. We also want to use variables to store data. We have labels and symbolic names, but these are just constants, which can be textually replaced. So they're just direct aliases for memory addresses. Uh, we want something that also stands for a memory address. A variable stands for a memory address, obviously, but can be used much more easily than names and uh, labels. We also want to work with data types that are not directly available on your processor. So your processor might be able to work on 8-bit data like characters and 32-bit data like integers, but maybe not on arrays of strings or arrays of floating point numbers or different data structures or even objects. So the assembler doesn't know anything about higher level data types. It only knows the very few primitive machine data types. And if you want to do some more complex processing, like you want to write a database to process students' records, that's not the abstraction to do it on assembler level. Of course, we also want to be able to modularize our program. So we want something like functions or methods. We want to be able to declare them, to declare their interface. So their parameters, they accept the parameters they uh, return. We want to be able to automatically pass and return parameters and have storage allocated without manually taking care of that. And of course, if we go a level higher, we want to have maybe something like classes and objects. And to do this, we need something more than an assembler. We need a compiler. So a compiler actually can be used to translate all these constructs we want to have to make problem solving easier for us to write programs that are easy to understand and easy to write. And compilers are used to translate these constructs to machine language because the machine language is the only language, these bit patterns as you've seen, the only language the computer understands. So uh, the computer cannot really read a C or Java program. Uh, that doesn't help, it would just crash if you try to execute a C program source code directly. So what does our compilation process look like? Well, let's uh, assume we have a source code file like a C file here with a main function returning an integer. And this has uh, just a number of instructions. For example, this sum instruction here in the middle. What we want in the end is what uh, can be seen on the right hand side. So we want some set of bits indicating the machine instructions here written as hexadecimal, 32 bit numbers for an ARM processor, for example. But in a sense, uh, we want a binary output that our machine can understand. Now to do this, we have to transform the C source code somehow to actually generate all these hexadecimal output numbers. And essentially that's what this semester's course in compiler construction is all about. How to get from this textual high level description, which is relatively easy to understand for a human, uh, 
to the instruct, uh, instruction representation on the lower right hand side which our machine can understand. So here's one example going from C to assembler. So we have a little C program here and this program uh, is used to convert uppercase ASCII characters to lowercase letters. So we implement this as a C function which is called to lower. To lower is passed the character that we want to convert and it returns the converted character. And to uh, actually do the conversion, we first have to check if the uh, character that's passed is actually an uppercase character, because if it's not an uppercase character, we actually don't have to convert it at all. So here we make use of knowledge that's very, very close to the machine. For example, we compare our character to yeah, character values. So we compare in our if condition here, if our past character is greater or equal a capital A and at the same time less or equal a capital Z. So it's in between A and Z, capital letters inclusive. And this only works because internally our compiler translates this to numbers our machine can understand. So on the lower right hand side you see an ASCII table and this ASCII table has codes for uh, all the characters, digits and special characters. And you see the characters from A to Z are actually consecutive. So A is hexadecimal for 1, B is for 2, uh, until Z is hexadecimal 5A. And essentially what our compiler does is create a comparison to check if C is larger or equal than hexadecimal 41 and C is less or equal than hexadecimal 5A. And then this conversion uh, makes use of another property of our ASCII table. It just adds a value to C. So if you look at the ASCII table going from an uppercase to a lowercase a, means you go two columns to the right. So from 4, 1 to 6, 1. So if you take the difference from 6, 1 to 4, 1, actually that's exactly what you have to add to the value of a uppercase a to get to the lowercase a. And that's exactly what the compiler does here. It calculates the numerical difference between the representation of a lowercase a and the representation of an uppercase A and adds this value, which is OX20, uh, to C. Of course, we could have written C plus equals OX20 directly, but then again, this would not really indicate what's going on. This makes the code a bit clearer. So this is a piece of example code you see very often. So here you still have machine dependencies. If your characters were encoded somehow differently, you'd have a problem. Your code would stop to run. And essentially there are very few, but there are some computers that have a different character encoding. Uh, for example, where uh, in between your alphabetic characters, A to Z, there's some different control characters uh, introduced. So the only machines I know of that still use these systems are IBM mainframes. So the Z series of large, iron, big iron IBM mainframes. And uh, I know a person who had the task of porting the Apache web server from Unix to these IBM mainframes. And he ran into exactly this problem because there were hundreds or thousands of places in the C code of that web server where this assumption was made that actually all ASCII characters are in one consecutive block. And so you could check using a range of uh, numbers from capital A to capital Z if a character was an uppercase character. So this is programming close to the hardware. So you really have to may uh, be sure what you're operating on, what data you're operating on, but still this makes life much more easier than having to program this in assembler. So how do we work on converting this code to assembler? So what would our compiler do? Now this is very much simplified, uh, so the process is of course a bit more complex, otherwise we wouldn't need a complete semester to describe it. So the first thing we know is that the assembler only uh, supports very primitive condi uh, conditional branches, which only can check for one condition. So the first thing we do is we have this complex if condition, so which uh, combines the two comparisons to uppercase and uh, A and uppercase that with an AND operator. And we have to break this down into two separate if conditions so our machine can understand this. So we can simplify our expression our if expression here uh, to actually 
uh, yeah, write it like uh, shown on the lower hand side. So we split this up into se two separate dependent if conditions here. So the compiler changes the end condition into consecutive ifs, ifs and we show this still as simplified C code. The other problem is that uh, the machine instructions usually are so, so called three address instructions. So they take two input parameters and one output parameter. So you can say add two numbers and store the result in a register. So if you want to add three numbers, you have to break this down again. And breaking this down is uh, what happens inside of our if condition. So the C plus equals line has to be broken down because we add and subtract on the same line. So again, we have to break this down. And here we have to introduce something like a temporary variable. So we first store the value of A, lowercase a in this temporary variable. Then we subtract the value of the uppercase A from this. And then finally, we add this difference between lowercase and uppercase a to our character in case it was an uppercase character to start with. So this is so-called three address code. We're breaking this down and this is a representation that's much easier to translate down to machine code than what we've seen above. Now what we can do now is we actually can transform this simplified C code to assembler. We could directly translate it to binary machine code, but that would make it very hard to figure out what's going on. So here we translate it to assembler. Um, various compilers do it in different ways. There are compilers that actually have an explicit stage where they output assembler code and use a separate assembler to translate it to binary code. But there are also compilers that directly generate the binary executable code without going through an assembler stage. So we convert this simplified C program here to a, a simpler code, in this case for an ARM processor in the so-called thumb mode. So this might be something you have in an embedded pr uh, ARM processor like a Cortex-M3 or M4. So uh, we need to simplify this quite a bit more because as we've seen, we don't have any variables in assembler. So we need to assign our variables we have in C to some storage elements we have in our processor. And these are the processor registers, as long as we don't run out of registers, which we just assume. So let's, let's just say we have two variables here. We have a variable C, which we want to store in R0, and we have a variable temp, which we just introduced, which we want to store in R1. And now we can relatively simply uh, translate these instructions into assembler instructions. So you see, the first if instruction here, if C is greater or equal than uppercase A, it's translated into a compare instruction and then a branch lower, a branch if less than. Why is this happening? This is interesting because in C, if the condition is fulfilled, you continue executing the code inside of your curly brackets after the if. In assembler, if the condition is fulfilled, you execute the jump instruction. So essentially, you jump around the contents of your if, if the condition is fulfilled. So you need to invert the original condition going from greater or equal to less than in order to make this work with assembler. So the second if, as you see, compares to 5a, which is the ASCII code for a capital Z. And if it's greater than a capital Z, it also jumps around the contents of what's inside the if block and if we're actually inside the if block, we know we have an uppercase character and then we use R1 to store a uppercase, uh, lowercase a, OX61. We subtract the ASCII code for an uppercase a, OX41 from that. And then we add the contents of R1 to R0, which is our character, which is also the register where this value is returned. So return C has no explicit instruction here to return the value because there's a convention that return values are always contained in R0. And the last instruction BXLR is the instruction to return from a function in our assembler. So what's happening in detail when we proce uh, compile processes? Well, we want to have something executing in our hardware and we start with source code in a high level language. Now this source code, as you've already seen in the uh, C crash course, 
is first passed through a preprocessor. This preprocessor is really, really simple and primitive. Text replacements and some very primitive uh, parameter expansions, but you've already seen in the crash course that you really have to take care to use them correctly. Now this preprocessor actually is just a text processing, so you input C code with preprocessor instructions, so everything that has a hash mark at the beginning of the line, and the preprocessor outputs the uh, C source code where all the preprocessor instructions are replaced with C code. So you still have C code, preprocessed C code at the, as the output of the preprocessor, and this is then passed to your C compiler. So the preprocessor originally was a separate program. You can also uh, execute it separately to figure out what's going on. And uh, this compiler then, for example, generates assembler source code. So the assembler source code usually has a .s as a file ending because .a was already used and s for assembler also works quite well. So this assembler code is still text source code, which is human readable. And this is then passed to a tool, which is also called confusing the assembler, which translates all of this to binary code. This is machine or object code where uh, all our textual mnemonics and register numbers are already translated to the binary or hexadecimal patterns our machine can understand. But usually a program consists of several source files. So if we have several object files, we have to tie up the references to external functions, for example. So we link them together using a linker. This linker also uses some libraries, usually like the C library. And then finally, you get an executable program code file. And this can be stored on disk or you can download it from the net. And when you start it, uh, there's a piece of the operating system called a loader. This loader has the task of loading the executable code file from disk into memory and then finally starting it so you can run your program on your computer. And if it doesn't work, well, there's a tool called the debugger where you can actually inspect the program while it's running. So you can look at uh, variables at runtime. Uh, you can uh, stop a program, you can restart it. Uh, you can dump memory and so on to figure out what's going wrong when your program does something which you didn't expect. But Compilers can do more than just translate from, let's say, C code to machine code. Compilers are a very general technique to transform one representation of information to a different representation on the same or on a different abstraction levels. So for example, there are uh, many source to source compilers or also called transpilers. There's C to C compilers. W what sense does this make? Well, a C to C compiler can, for example, be used to check for valid constructs in C or maybe to replace constructs which are not uh, supported on your machine like floating point numbers with calls to libraries. There's a very commonly used compiler uh, to translate one of the very first programming languages, which is called Fortran, to C because uh, there are Unix systems that really don't support a Fortran compiler but have a C compiler. But there's also more modern stuff that actually increase the abstraction level a bit. So there's a tool called mscripten, and this takes C or C++ code and compiles it to JavaScript. So you can actually execute C or C++ code in your web browser. But there's more applications. You can do a static binary transformation. For example, you can do uh, try to optimize a binary you're trying to execute for a given processor. Uh, there's a tool called Dynamo that uh, was a research project from HP Lab that does this. And you've maybe already seen things like just-in-time compilers for the Java VM or the Android Dalvik or Arch just-in-time compiler that actually takes a high-level description in so-called bytecodes and translates this to machine instructions on the fly. So where, while you execute the program, this has the advantage of yeah, adaptation of the program at runtime. So it, you don't have to care which processor you write your program for, but it's compiled when it's executed. So the machine you execute your Java bytecode on knows uh, what it has to translate your bytecodes to in order to make it executable on your processor you have in your computer. Some of this was also done in hardware uh, by a company called Transmeta. 
in the late 1990s. That's a company Linus Torvalds worked for, so the guy who invented Linux. So they had a processor family called Crusoe. And what they did is they wanted to generate or to, to, in, uh, to build very low power Intel compatible processors. And building them directly in hardware would have required licensing them from Intel, which is either very expensive or impossible. So what they did is they built a just-in-time compilation uh, layer that ran as firmware on the transmitter Crusoe's and which compiled Intel machine code while the system was running down to the special machine code of the transmitter Crusoe processor. So they were circumventing Intel patents by this and uh, people weren't too happy about that. So here's an example for Emscripten as a source to source compiler. This is based on the LLVM compiler toolset. So LLVM is uh, one of the uh, famous compiler toolsets that has been in development for quite a number of years yet. Uh, it started as a master thesis as a, at an American university and now is one of the uh, most commonly used compiler toolsets. It's open source and it can compile C, C, but also a number of different languages and has lots of backends. So this Emscripten source to source compiler actually runs as a so-called backend, so the code generator, but it doesn't generate machine code for an Intel or ARM processor, but it generates code in a subset of JavaScript called WebAssembly or WASM uh, that can be executed in your uh, web browser. And there's an example use case. Uh, you can run Doom or Quake, which is written in C originally for a 486 machine in your web browser now by automatically having uh, it translated using the Emscripten toolkit. And you see the translation here on the left hand side. So there's an example of a bit of C code on the left hand side. And the right hand side is actually what this uh, WebAssembly uh, JavaScript representation looks like. So it looks a bit like assembler code because it's very primitive JavaScript. But this also enables it to be executed very fast in your web browser. So that's a fun thing and it helps because it can bring a lot of code on the web so you don't have to care which platform it's executed on. That's quite nice. But there's also quite different views of codes. So compilers can also be used in very, very different domains. So one interesting idea I've seen, which is a current research project of colleagues, is a so-called matter compiler. So if you have something like 3D printers, uh, usually you have to give the 3D printer something that's very close to what I'd say is a sem uh, some assembler level description. So you see it uh, next to the photo on the bottom here. This is a so-called G code. Uh, this is called because almost all instructions start with the letter G. And this just gives coordinates uh, to the printer where to move. This is very similar to assembler instructions. But what you really want to give to your compiler is a structural description. So I want you to print a case for my Raspberry Pi. So uh, something like this. So you need to map a high level description or design of a physical thing you want to print to instructions for the 3D printer manufacturing that thing. And doing this, you can check for correctness like a programming language compiler that detects errors and outputs warnings. It can also check for impossible requirements because your printer can't print free hanging components in the air or it can try to optimize to save material during compilation. And that's pretty fun, I think, uh, to work with. So compilers can do lots of different things and the basic technologies behind all of these. So parsing high-level languages, translating them, analyzing dependencies, finding errors are all very closely related. And that's what you're going to learn about in this course. And it even gets a bit more crazy. There's something called a carpentry, carpentry compiler. So when a carpenter wants to build a shelf, he can actually now say, oh yeah, uh, I want a description of a shelf. And it outputs optimized code for uh, CNC machines to actually generate optimized uh, milling of shelves and stuff like that to build all this. So this is also compiler technology uh, with a very abstract input, like maybe graphics. Uh, and an output that again controls a uh, machine on a very low level, in this case, a CNC router instead of a processor. So again, here compiler techniques are really important uh, to get this to work. So what are we going to talk about in this semester? Uh, we'll take a look at the structure of a typical compiler, and then we'll take a look at the several parts of that compiler. So we'll start at the front with your program source code in C, for example, your input. Uh, so this has to be split into several components like words. This is so-called scanning, which is simple, which is a process based on uh, automata. 
and then you have to recreate the structure of your program so the nested loops and if conditions and functions and so on uh, which is done using parsing and grammars so to generate an intermediate representation so you, your compiler can actually reason about what your program is doing so you have intermediate representations there's different ways to do this there's so-called abstract syntax trees so it's a tree-based representation of the structure of your program you can also have text-based representation in so-called static single assignment or ssa form and this is the interface between the front and the back end so so far we weren't concerned with what we are actually going to output so the back end is concerned with really generating code for the processor we want to generate code for so this contains a, a code generation and optimization and maybe even linking and static code analysis are also parts we are going to take a closer look at throughout the semester so that's all for today uh, but the question really is uh, if you're taking this course the first thing you would want to do is ah oh yeah i can write a compiler now so let me design my own new great language just because yes i have an idea that nobody had before well uh, unfortunately you're not the first one so on the right hand side it might be a bit hard to see uh, is an overview of like uh, programming languages that have been developed uh, in the run of 20 years and you see it's more than a hundred and I've marked the four with a purple uh, circle around them to indicate which one of those from starting from the early uh, 1960s to now are actually still in use and it's actually four of them so it's really fun to design your own language and sometimes it's really worthwhile because for example you want to have something like a domain specific language to control characters in your online role-playing game stuff like that or you want to automate uh, writing configuration files for your 3d printer so it's worthwhile for this but writing a general purpose programming language and hoping it has some success that's an interesting approach some people are trying this right now so some people have come up with new programming languages over the last 10 to 15 years like rust by the mozilla Von, uh, foundation or go by google uh, c sharp by microsoft these are all relatively new languages uh, they have some mixed sort of success but it's not clear how many of these languages will still be used like in 10 or 15 years but still it's fun to think about it it's uh, fun to design your own language so uh, i won't discourage you from doing this but uh, probably it won't be the next hit on the programming language uh, market i'm afraid so uh, what happens with programming languages is what you see in this xkcd comics here so a programming language is just a standard for programming computers and so let's say well you have 14 different programming languages and all of these have some disadvantages or just plain stupid or something like this so you come up with an idea oh yes i'll write my own programming language that can replace all these old and problematic 14 languages yeah and what happens is you have 15 competing programming languages because nobody's willing to rewrite code or give up his or her own programming language but that's what happens and that's what makes computing interesting to have this diversity of approaches but of course uh, it means for you that computer science is something like lifelong learning so if you learned a programming language today you cannot be sure to use it until whatever you retire for example uh, but you can pretty be pretty safe with C programming that C will still be available like in 10 or 15 years because there's so much C code around uh, that's hard to replace so C has managed to live for almost 50 years already so I see there's a number of chances that you'll also see C code in the upcoming decades let's see now uh, if you want to dig a bit deeper here are some references for you so uh, there's a paper on M scripting uh, to compile uh, LLVM to JavaScript there's papers on programming language history on binary translation there's a paper on the carpentry compiler uh, for building shelves and on the 3d uh, compiling stuff so uh, this uh, was an introduction to compilation and we'll take a look, closer look at parts of our compiler starting with scanning in the next lecture thanks for listening until next time